This unit is on fluoroscopy. This is the first presentation, and I'm going to give you the historical overview of how fluoroscopy developed. So the objectives of this lesson are to demonstrate the knowledge of the development of the fluoroscopy equipment, describe the anatomy and function of the eye with the different types of vision, and it is related. So what we're going to look at is the relationship between the development of fluoroscopy equipment and the functionality of vision. Wilhelm Rankin, in 1895, created man-made x-rays. He was using an x-ray tube, a Crookes tube, and a fluorescent screen coated with calcium tungstate. He put his hand between the source and the screen and moved his fingers. So this was actually the very first dynamic image. And of course, there's no proof of that because it was a dynamic image. There was no static image. So he actually later worked with glass plates to create static images of anatomy, which includes the famous picture of his wife's hand. Other people were also developing fluoroscopy at the time, a gentleman named um, Silvoni. He was working in Italy. He created um, what he called the cryptoscope. And McGee was named a skioscope. But it was Thomas Edison, who was already well known, who received the most publicity, probably because of his other inventions. And he named the dynamic imaging fluoroscopy. So, the image is showing Thomas Edison and his assistant, Clarence Dolly. They worked closely together and they were actually great friends. Clarence Dolly began to experience physical symptoms about four years after the time that he worked with fluoroscopy. And eventually he died of um, overexposure. Well, when he lost his friend and colleague, Edison stopped working with radiation and fluoroscopy and he's reported to have said, I stopped working with x-rays because I was afraid of them. Dolly's story is that in 1900, he started to, um, after he was working with Edison, he began to show lesions and degenerative skin conditions on his hands and face. His hair began to fall out, then his eyebrows and his eyelashes. Soon, his face was heavily wrinkled and his left hand was especially swollen and painful. He was a faithful researcher, though he was very committed to science. Dolly found the perfect solution to prevent any more damage to his left hand. He began to use his right hand instead. Now, the result might have been predictable. At night, he slept with both hands in water to alleviate the burning. Like many researchers at the time, Dolly assumed he would heal and rest um, with time away from these x-ray tubes. So the dangers of radiation were becoming very well known. And as you look at that picture of Thomas Edison, you can see that he is looking directly into the x-ray source. It's underneath Dolly's hand. And Dolly had his hand even closer to the source. So these early images were very dim and had very unclear edges. And something had to be done to make these images more bright. So this led to the development of the image intensifier to increase brightness levels. This progression took almost 50 years. So in the 1940s, we're looking at um, a technician, as they were called in the early years, um, using fluoro to image a female patient. So the technician is sitting in front of the plate looking at the screen. The source is behind the female. So all the um, direct source is hitting him right in the face. But you do notice he is wearing rubberized gloves. So in the 50s, I know I mentioned that they used to have an x-ray um, fluoroscopy unit where you would step into it to see if your shoes fit when you were buying new shoes. This device could be viewed above by the salesman or the parents or the person trying on the, the shoes. 
and the person with the sh trying on the shoes would stand right on the x-ray source. This was used, um, like I said, in the 1950s, and actually I remember people talking about it being at some department stores, um, and I was born later than that, so probably at least 10 years later it was um, kind of moving away. So this image shows the medical use of fluoroscopy. The screen above is above the patient and the x-ray source is below, just like we find now in fixed modern day units. You do notice that there still is not an image intensifier or a viewing monitor. Um, so improvements were slow because it was seemed to be more important to document any findings that you found in fluoroscopy. Um, plus the radiation doses were very high. So static images became um, pursued more heavily and because they had better spatial resolution and contrast resolution and it could be looked at more than one time. Eventually before in image intensifiers were developed. They added mirrors so that the person performing the procedure didn't have to look directly into the source. The image would reflect off of mirrors and um, the radiologist could look at the mirror to see the image. So fluoroscopists had to dark adapt before the image intensifier was developed because the images were so dim. This meant sitting in a dark room for about 15 minutes or wearing specialized red lens goggles when viewing the fluoroscopic screen. So dark adapt means that they were activating the rods in the peripheral of the retina. So let's look at the anatomy of the eye. This is very basic and we will have to look at it to understand how the eye functions because this is foundational to the development of the fluoroscopic equipment. Before the development of image intensifiers and fluoroscopy, the radi radiologists had to dark adapt their vision to see the images because they were so dim. The eye is actually quite remarkable because it can adapt to many levels of light. The illumination that the eye can see is measured in lumens or candelas per meter squared. This is also called lux, L-U-X. It's not so important to memorize those terms. It's just important that you can recognize that it is a unit of measurement for any type of luminescence. And this, is, this pertains to monitor viewing. I also want to note that the cones are located within the fovea centralis and the rods are found in the peripheral of the retina layer. In these cells, the rods and cones are considered photoreceptors. So at the very front of the eye, we actually have this protective coating called the cornea and then behind it, there's a lens, which is actually an optical disc, and then between it, there's the iris. So the optical disc lets in the light and focuses back to the seeing part of the eye, which is the rods and the cones, or in the retina, and the iris contracts and dilates to um, limit the amount of light coming in or to allow more light to come in by dilating. So the rods and the cones are embedded in the retina. There are a hundred thousand rods and cones per meter squared of area. So that means that there are a hundred million rods and six million cones in the eye. So the rods are only in the peripheral of the retina and they're sensitive to low light. They really um, cannot respond to intense light, only about two lux. The cones, those are in the pocket of the fovea centralis and they're less sensitive to light. They can respond to more intense light, about a hundred lux. 
So the light moves through the lens to the back of the eye, which is the retina. The light hits the discs that are part of the rods and cones, and the small amount of light photons are, activate those cells. Rods are acti activated in low light, while cones need many more light photons to hit them to be activated. So these activated photoreceptor cells send their signal to the neural cells, and the neural cells send them to the optic nerve. The optic nerve sends the signal to the brain where it's processed so the complete image can be seen rather than in little parts of rods and cones being activated. Cones are called um, photopic vision or daylight vision and it's also where color is formed, red, blue, and green. Cones, unlike rods, perceive small objects. And this is the visual acuity. This is where you can see detail. Cones can see variations in density. This is contrast perception. Rods are considered nighttime vision or scotopic vision. Dim objects are viewed peripherally. So when you're looking at like a star in the sky, sometimes you have to turn your head and that's because the um, rods are trying to let light in and be activated so you can see in the dark. So the dark adapt method was needed to activate those rods. Um, but the problem with that is the rods did not have good um, acuity or detail, ability to see detail, or they also had less contrast resolution. So the goal was to um, help image diagnosis is to have the cones activated. And for that to happen, image brightness needed to increase. So that was the development of image intensification. So let's do a little review. What is the unit of measurement to measure luminescence? It's candela per meter squared or lumen per meter squared, which is also known as lux. What is the function of the iris? It acts as a diaphragm by constricting or dilating to allow light to reach the retina. So where are the cones located? In the fovea centralis. What type of vision are they responsible for and what are their unique functions? So cones are responsible for daytime vision, photopic vision they're called, it's also where color vision is formed. It's visual acuity, the ability to see detail, and contrast perception, the ability to see differences in um, different luminescent values. What is nighttime vision called? Scott topic. So what's the point? So the development of fluoroscopy equipment began with the crude images that required very high amounts of radiation and then in the end only produced a dim and vague image that was difficult to view unless a lot of preparation was done. So dark adapting had to happen, images were needed to be made brighter, and we also needed to have more protection for the person looking at the dynamic image screen directly so they could be out of the direct source of radiation. So that is what helped to develop the image intensifier. Um, it was through the vision of the eye.